Hello and welcome to the Particular Baptist Podcast. My name is Daniel Vincent, here with my co-host Sean Sheetham. Um, today is part two of an episode we did on Reformed Baptist Life a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we'll be continuing our discussion today on that. Uh, before we dive into that, I want to remind everyone, um, check us out on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, we have the banner at the bottom with those uh, those handles on how you can find us there. Also check out our blog at theparticularbaptist.net. We update that weekly. Um, and with that, I'll turn over to Sean to introduce our guest and our topic. Yes, uh, today we're welcoming back uh, our pastor, Pastor Steve Clevenger. Uh, thank you again for uh, being on our podcast. Oh, glad to be here. And uh, today we'll be picking off uh, from last time we had uh, Pastor Steve on, last podcast, well, it was two podcasts ago, but last podcast on this topic, we had been talking about Reformed Baptist history. And um, now we're going to, now that we've caught up to the present, essentially, we're going to be talking about where do we think Reformed Baptist life is going. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pose that question to you, uh, uh, Pastor Steve. Um, what, what are the current issues that we're facing and where do you see uh, Reformed Baptist life going? Okay. I, I keep, uh, you ask a question and then I keep pushing back a little bit on going back in time. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I would say where Reformed Baptist are at today, and I was wanting to bring in just a, a, a few more minutes of some history here, because this helps us understand where we are today and where we're going. But, but as I as I discussed last time and where we uh, where we left off, uh, if you remember those early particular uh, what we would call early particular Baptists, they were actually uh, congregationless churches, as we said, of the 17th century. Uh, that we would now identify, we would use the name particular Baptist. They didn't necessarily take that name, uh, but they were they were churches that were truly uh, or essentially Puritan Congregationalist churches uh, that came to the conviction of a believer's baptism. And one of the things I mentioned was uh, how they would identify themselves. Here's a facsimile of the um, of the 1677. Uh, right here. Oh, it's on the camera. There's a facsimile of it. And if if you notice how they identify themselves, not as Baptists, uh, that's not on the name of the document. Uh, it's just a confession of faith put forth by the elders and brethren of many congregations. And then notice how they describe themselves of Christians baptized upon profession of their faith. Uh, in London and in the country, so that's how they would they would simply identify themselves as Christians that were or baptized Christians, baptized upon their uh, confession of of faith, is how they would see themselves. And then later we uh, they would begin to take the name on as Baptists, uh, as that name was tagged to them, maybe by even the Quakers is where that name was beginning to be identified. Uh, where these Baptists were, were getting that name, and and later we would know them as that, and especially within our tradition as Reformed Baptists today, we identify ourselves with that uh, that stream of Baptists called Particular Baptists. And so we looked at it very, very broadly, and a few things I wanted to bring up concerning the history of that. I just wanted to recommend a few books, because we we went through that rather quickly. Uh, we didn't get in details. I mean, we could speak about famous people, Henry Jacob, uh, Benjamin Keach, Nehemiah Cox, the early, uh, William Kiffin, but uh, some materials that, or books that I would recommend. Um, uh, B.R. White's book, The English, English Baptists of the 17th Century. Uh, this is hard to find. It's not a long book, but that's a good book. And then... Uh, this has come out recently. Uh, uh, this. Are you still able to hear Pastor Steve, ma'am? I can't hear him anymore. Oh, I think uh, your mic cut off, Pastor Steve. Sorry about that. Uh, can you hear Oh, me? now we can hear. Yep. Ah, yep. I don't know what happened there. But this is Matthew Bingham's book, uh, Orthodox Radicals. Uh, I need to get my hands on one of those. They're just pricey. Yeah. <laughs> They're very pricey, uh, but this book is very important concerning that topic about uh, early particular Baptists. 
and then what later we would identify in our time as a Reformed Baptist. So those would be books of that uh, of uh, history. I would also recommend um, a few other resources concerning uh, early particular Baptists. Jim Renahan's book, Jim yep. Renahan's book, Edification and Beauty, uh, the Practical Ecclesiology of the English Particular Baptist from 1675, uh, 1675 to 1705. Very helpful. You can see mine is just ragged and got stuff marked. Uh, I use this book constantly. Uh, and, there, and there is. There's very practical things in there. You, you have questions about, as a, as a pastor, and having discussions with fellow elders and church members about, you know, how should we do this or that? Often you can find things from the past. We can learn from the past. This is retrieval. Uh, another book, um, uh, Faith and Life for Baptists, the documents of uh, London particular Baptist assemblies from 1689 to 1694. Uh, this is put out by um, Reformed Baptist Academic Press, uh, which is ran by Richard Barcellus. Again, early documents that are very helpful in understanding uh, our, uh, our fathers. Uh, and then, um, of course, the confession. Uh, oh, wrong one. That was three forms of unity. Uh -huh. uh, uh, here it is. Uh, the confession of faith. You can even get hardbound, leatherbound that are available out there now. And the Baptist catechism. Uh, here's the central issue that develops into what we would say is a recovery of who we are as Reformed Baptists. And then again, uh, published by uh, uh, Reformed Baptist Academic Press is Hercule Collins. It's an updated version of an Orthodox, Orthodox catechism. Uh, so again, these, uh, I would even recommend um, uh, Benjamin Bedham's uh, A Scriptural Exposition of the Baptist Catechism. Um, Waldron's book, An Exposition, in 1689. All of these are, and, and there's many more, but uh, and there's even, I just stuck some stuff here in my book. Little books that are being published today. Uh, the Glory of a True Church by Benjamin Keach. If you want to know about early Baptist ecclesiology, very simple, very helpful. And then there's a series of little books uh, that Reformed Baptist Academic has been putting out uh, that are titled Recovering Our Confessional Heritage. Uh, there's four. I, I don't think there's any more than that. There might be one in the pipeline coming out, but there's a defense of confessionalism, associational churchmanship, uh, the covenant of works. Another helpful one, a toolkit for confessions. Um, another uh, good book to have an understanding our past. But um, so these, uh, they're, again, a growing, while there was at one time not very much in a way of resources uh, for uh, particular Baptists or for modern Reformed Baptists to understand our history accurately or to understand our documents concerning our confession, like our confession of faith and catechism. They were not available, but now this stuff is rolling out wonderfully uh, on a regular basis, and it's increasing. And this is a wonderful thing that we're witnessing uh, in our lifetime. Um, so I, I was just going to say that by the where we left off last time, by the mid-20th century, uh, there would be men and churches uh, that began to, as we were saying, learn anew uh, the doctrines of the past. Uh, there was a recovery, a rediscovery of, of our confession, that it, that it even existed. Uh, it, it may have been found in some book here or there, but men were rediscovering the existence of the confession. They began to study it, and, um, and we continue that till this day of studying the confession, studying our history, and what those men were, were, were saying and teaching in the past. And uh, so we're growing in that. Um, now, the, the, the question that you guys had lined up for me, why do I think that there has been a resurgence? Why do I think there's been a resurgence in revisiting particular Baptist history? Um, and I would say a resurgence in 
particular Baptist history and theology, this resurgence, this revisiting particular Baptist history and theology, is really it, it's really a kind of, if we would say, a, a kind of renaissance in the sense of a rebirth and a going back and looking at these things. Um, I would say, now this is from my vantage point, from what I have learned and, and witnessed, other men may differ on this, but it, it, it seems to me that um, that when we talk about um, and begin to discuss older particular Baptists and then what we are today as modern Reformed Baptists, that yes, there were forces, as we said previously, within and without of the churches that greatly affected the churches and brought about theological drift. We mentioned revivalism, modernism. We can think of modernity as we understand it today. Uh, and the, uh, this belief that somehow the, the past, um, you know, today is more important than the past uh, and how that just began to affect things theologically. But by the grace of God, by the middle of the 20th century, especially by the by the 1960s, um, um, with the awareness of the confession and a, and a, the beginning of a recovery of our confession and its understanding, there begin to be churches and individuals and forces that led to the present setting of Reformed Baptists in North America and its continuing uh, growth. And um, and people beginning to uh, uh, I forgot the word you used, John, um, but be begin to desire to know more about this interest in mm -hmm. this the word interest. I think you used um, one. I would say that it began with um, by the early 1960s. Uh, you had men and churches like Grace Baptist Church in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, with the pastoral ministry of Walt Chantry. And he began to write. Um, you had Trinity Baptist Church, Montville, New Jersey, with Pastor Al Martin and the strong pulpit ministry there and the fellowship of of uh, pastors within those circles that developed into what early on became the Trinity Ministerial Academy, where they were training men and churches were being planted. Um, so that became a strong influence. And then even. Uh, the Reformed Baptist Church of Grand Rapids, which is now a few years ago, they changed their name. Uh, now they are known as the uh, Grace Emmanuel Reformed Baptist Church. And the elders in that church, uh, there are many of them, but uh, but in but we especially think of how the, the strong teaching ministry of that church and the men out of there, how they've greatly influenced uh, uh, Reformed Baptists in our day. Especially in North America, we think of men like Greg Nichols and Sam Waldron. There are others there, how they have been an influence. But there's been other things that people may have not uh, considered um, because Walt Chantry begins to have some influence being in Carlisle uh, with um, the Banner of, Banner of Truth Trust, of the Ministry of uh, produ Reproducing uh, Reformed and Puritan Books. And, and as that comes out of that time period into our present day, those books being republished and reprinted begins to have an effect upon um, not only Presbyterian circles, but Baptist circles and even non-Calvinistic um, men that are pastors begin to read those books and begin to move into more Calvinistic uh, understanding of of the doctrine of salvation. And so those men influence even in Southern Baptist circles, but but just Baptists. And so Baptists begin to take by the 70s, 60s, they're taking on more of a Calvinistic flavor and understanding the doctrine of salvation. Um, and then through the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention Founders Ministry, uh, Tom Askell, Tom Nettles, uh, and then Ernie Reisinger, who is connected with the church in Carlisle, is now plugged in. He was plugged in with the Founders Movement. And all of this is in the process of rediscovering our past. 
And and I would even say, no, the, the recovery of Reformed Baptists and the, the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689 and its theology, people sometimes forget that those men, even before these other things happened, they began to be influenced by books like Pi A.W. Pink, out of the beginning of the 20th century, his books. It was A.W. Pink, author Pink's book, The Sovereignty of God, that turned my world upside down in understanding the doctrine of salvation. Um, uh, the same book, uh, Steve Lawson, I was able to, when he pastored the Bible Church of Little Rock, when I lived in Arkansas, I was able to have lunch with him, and he mentioned how the influence of the book by A.W. Pink, The Sovereignty of God, moved him and turned his world upside down concerning those kind of convictions. And not only was that out there, but then uh, the reprinting of Charles Spurgeon's sermons and that those coming out there, John Gill, his writings. And then by the second half of the 20th century, though they are not what we'd call Reformed Baptists, the ministry of John MacArthur uh, began to move into a very Calvinistic direction and his emphasis upon expository preaching. And that began to spread out among uh, evangelicals, Southern Baptists, other groups. And again, with the connection of preaching through books of the Bible, a Calvinistic soteriology. And when that happened and men began to find the the 1689 Confession, read it. They go, here it is. And so that helped. And then R.C. Sproul and the, and the ministry of Ligonier in, this, in these, these last 40 years, uh, R.C. not only explaining what we would say is Calvinism, but he began to help us to see the richness of historical theology and of the past and why it mattered. And that was affecting. So you had... Men within reform circles already, men in broader evangelical circles, and they're coming to these convictions. All these streams are coming together. And then at the same time, I can even think of men my age and, and, their, and in my circles, they're even – we're being influenced. The internet's coming online. <laughs> the internet's arriving. And a guy like Phil Johnson with Grace to You begins to set up the Spurgeon Archive online and people are reading sermons from John I mean from Charles Spurgeon online and his defense of Calvinism and stuff so all of this is just causing this interest and this blossoming of reformed and baptistic truth from A.W. Pink's books being reprinted Spurgeon's books being reprinted the internet uh, MacArthur R.C. Sproul the continual ministry of men like Sam Waldron Walt Chantry um, um, Al Martin, all these things are happening all at the same time. Now, with that going on, we have now today, today, in our present setting, and what's interesting, today, a popular or trendy movement in theological circles is known as theological retrieval. You, there's starting to be books written about theological retrieval, and that's become a, a topic of interest. Um, and what I mean by theological retrieval, let, let, retrieval, let me quote Kevin and Van Hooser on theological retrieval. He teaches uh, a theology at Trinity Evangelical Seminary, and uh, he says this, quote, theological retrieval is not simply retro theology. Retrieval names a way of doing theology, now listen to this, that looks back in order to move forward. That looks back in order to move forward. That sounds like the modern-day Reformed Baptist movement and how we have come onto the scene. We have moved forward. We continue it to advance by learning from the past, by looking back. He goes on to say, what motivates this return is not nostalgia, Retrieval has more in common with reformation, uh, but, it, it, but rather it's with the conviction that past resources, especially those tied in true doctrinal insights that made up the great tradition or like the solas, 
were the backbone of the Reformation are precisely what we need in this present situation. This conviction that classical sources outweigh contemporary norms ultimately derives not from my pining for the past, but rather from a biblically inspired confidence that the spirit, not newfangled methods or ideologies, has indeed been leading the church into truth, end quote. Now, what's interesting about what we are witnessing concerning theological retrieval, because in my estimation, the truth is that Reformed Baptists were doing theological retrieval before it was trendy and cool. We had been doing this now for the last 50 years. Uh, that is, as we came and found this wonderful document called the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689 and its catechism, began to study our past, study that doctrine, and, um, and the period of when it was developed. We have been in this process now for the last 50 years. It is rich and it is wonderful as truth begins to come on to the scene as we find it from the past and see it in the pages of Scripture. Uh, I personally can remember, and here's an example of retrieval in Reformed Baptist circles and the excitement about it. I could remember a Presbyterian minister visiting our congregation years ago and him saying Presbyterians had grown kind of cold concerning confessions and catechisms. However, when he came to our church, he was thrilled to see that our folks were excited about it. <laughs> so we can, we can see what's happening there. Now, we got to be careful that we don't go code about these things, but that we were constantly learning from the past, from the church of the past, rediscovering these truths, finding them above all in, rooted in Scripture and preaching, teaching them, and seeing the implications and application of these things uh, to our lives. So there's been this discovery of the Second London, and there's been research and recovery of a true understanding of the doctrines contained in the confession. And I'll just give you examples. For example, uh, the doctrine of the church, uh, the doctrine of worship and the regulative principle, covenant theology. We think about that the last number of years. Uh, and Jim Renahan and now Sam Renahan, um, uh, Pascal's book, uh, Pascal Denault, his book on uh, covenant theology, how these have been helpful. Uh, now we're seeing this um, interest uh, in the study concerning the doctrine of God as found in our confession, uh, concerning impassibility, his immutability, the simplicity of God, how this has been grown. These are good things. And what's Interesting about this, these are not only good things for us and for our churches as Reformed Baptists, but they've they've caught the attention of others outside of our circles and those outside of the in those other traditions. And as small as we are, they're paying attention now to what Reformed Baptists have to say as there's been this recovery of truth as it's touched upon those other traditions, because really. A lot of what we are rediscovering or recovering is nothing other than that which is found or, or known as, as the great tradition. Um, we're finding historic Christianity, that, that great tradition tied back to uh, what we think of the creeds, especially Nicaea, uh, the Nicaean understanding, the Trinitarian understanding of God, uh, back to the early church fathers and back to the Old and New Testaments. That, that's what we're really witnessing, uh, a true kind of retrieval and reformation uh, in that sense. We're going back to the sources. And that's gathering interest. To your question, Sean, this, this interest, uh, others, men in seminary, young men serving to the ministry, individuals desiring to learn to grow more in the truth, realizing that something isn't right about modern evangelicalism and the shallowness of it are hearing about these things and it's grabbing their attention and it's beginning to 
draw them into within uh, within our circles and our churches. That's why we're seeing growth uh, of young and old, but we're seeing a lot of young folks who have uh, they they see the shallowness of modern evangelicalism. Not not everywhere, but I'm just, but, but broadly, it's out there, and um, and they're being drawn to this. Uh, there was some uh, some interest back. Uh, early from late 90s up to around 2010 or so, what was known as the Young Restless Reform Movement. That that got some folks interested, but that, that was just a short little burst. Uh, that was a shallow movement in itself. It did not last long. Uh, we knew it would run its course. It tried to make out. Calvinism cool. Make, tried to make hip. Calvinism yep. cool and hip. Yeah, I remember someone asking me if I was a new Calvinist. I said, no, I'm an old Calvinist. And, <laughs> and, I, and I wasn't talking about my age. <laughs> uh, so so that kind of stuff is going on, and it's exciting uh, to see. So we're seeing that resurgence. We're seeing uh, these things recovered, and we praise God for men uh, within and without our own circles who are helping with this, men in Presbyterian circles, uh, even um, uh, Anglican circles, but even within our own Reformed Baptist circles, who in their studies, in their theological training and endeavors are growing and, and writing and helping some of us, many of us, and understanding these things. And and I'm just thankful for, to God for, for giving us such men and uh, for this gracious time in history that we're able to see these things and witness this. I think some of the, the reason why we see this, I guess, resurgence of, like you said, Presbyterian brother and like who have come to our church and have fellowship with us long-term. Um, I wonder if they're seeing maybe a, a coldness in their own churches um, that could maybe be related to some of their covenant theology or their ecclesiology. Um, but maybe they're seeing this resurgence um, in recovering those core doctrines that we share as a, the Baptists weren't trying to um, as much separate themselves as they were to show how much unified they were with their Anglican and their Presbyterian brothers. Um, so maybe that unity around court doctrines has really been attractive to those outside of Reformed Baptist circles. Yeah, I'm not sure. It could be It could be that. Um, um, I, I, I'm not sure because I'm, I'm not in those circles tightly, but... Right. You you may you may be right about that uh, that there are some other influences. I know that uh, some of the Presbyterian uh, groups are are struggling uh, from some influences of our day, um, but um, I hope the best for them. And, mm -hmm. uh, we can encourage them, and they can encourage us. Yep, yep. So I guess with you know with that in mind, what do we see? You know the the Reformed Baptist movement moving forward. Uh, where where do you see us going as a, as a denomination? Hmm. I wouldn't use the I, I I wouldn't use the word denomination, and I and I, uh, uh, but I know what you mean by that. I I I even hesitate to use the term Reform Baptist movement. I just want mm -hmm. to think of us as churches, Reform Baptist. Yeah, churches. I'm just trying to keep that distinction yeah. there. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um. Right now. Uh, There are some positive things that are happening, like I said, concerning retrieval and the writing of men. Again, from Jim Renahan to Sam Renahan to Richard Barcelos, um, James Dozel, um, mm -hmm. other men that we can probably, I had, just off the top of my head, I'm not thinking about, but that, that have uh, in very positive ways that are helping things move forward and helping us together to grow theologically. And understanding the past. Um, those are positive things. Uh, we're seeing, we've seen uh, not only churches uh, numerically growing as people are growing interest in this. That's a good thing. Um, uh, we are also seeing churches being planted. Uh, and so our churches themselves, local churches, are growing in the sense that they're being planted. So the, all those things are positive. We're seeing we have uh, basically three seminaries uh, mm -hmm. now uh, in North America uh, uh, with training men theologically. Um, the CBTS 
and in Owensboro, Kentucky. Uh, our church supports that. Men in our church uh, are attending classes or taking classes through that. Sean, Sean takes classes through that. Uh, IRBS with Jim Renahan down in Texas, and then over in California is the Reformed Baptist Seminary. So, uh, so that's encouraging to see that theological training has begun to firm up and is stronger than it was in the past. Um, and the churches uh, continue to grow uh, in, the, in, in truth and seem to be strengthening. Uh, now, there are forces, just as there was in the past, there's forces today pulling the churches, and you can, there's different flavors of, if I can use that term, of our Reformed Baptists. Um, again, we want to be charitable to uh, one another and to the churches and where there are differences. Uh, but there are some things, you, you asked the question, what are some of the biggest struggles that the, that the churches are going through? Um, if I, 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 if I was to list some off, I would say, uh, this issue of worship is probably a mm. big one. Um, uh, our understanding of the regulative principle. And again, that, that can differ, um, among us mm -hmm. and our understanding of that. Uh, but probably m the way musical instruments and how many, and things such as that uh, can be differ a, differ in application basically as opposed yeah. to differ in the idea that we need the regulative principle yeah yeah i i don't know of any rb church that says we don't believe in the regulative principle uh but how they understand that and how they apply that may differ so uh that's an area that um it's encouraging that our churches are at least confessing that uh Though there's differences that we may may raise eyebrows toward one another, but but at the same time, uh, it's encouraging that we can continue to grow in these things and understand these things. We can continue to push forward on an understanding, and we can learn from the past as we move forward, as we've been saying along the way here. Uh, associationalism uh, is another area uh, that. The churches continue to walk through that's that's can be difficult the independency and interdependency of the churches uh the truth is associationalism uh has had a bumpy road among baptists and and among reformed baptists and continues um and so that continues to be discussed and how can that be applied and how can we do better uh, from the past and what lessons can be learned. Um, confessionalism and the degree of it, that's a, that's, that continues to be a discussion. Um, the doctrine of God, as I've already mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, especially the classical doctrine of God, uh, this is probably one of the more serious issues that's being uh, discussed. Um, um, it and, and and yet worship is serious. We don't we we don't want to uh, say it's not serious, but the doctrine of God, but concerning impassibility, simplicity, and immutability. Uh, so we want to continue to have that discussion among it, the ministers, the the elders, the churches, on that. I hope that continues to move forward in a positive way and that there's there is a, a recovery uh, of what we would know as the classical doctrine of god um uh, pietism um that pietism and forms of uh, maybe you might call it personal fundamentalism as in the past and continues to be an issue uh, in the church where individuals have personal practices and beliefs, bring them into the life of the church. I think this is because our churches are typically very conservative. So mm -hmm. people of that demeanor are drawn to our churches, but they will unfortunately sometimes bring personal practices concerning their life and the home and begin to make those an issue in the life of the church. And so local church elders um have to walk through this carefully and our churches yeah. do 
Uh, now, one level, we should see this on one level, a good thing, and that 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 there are people who are serious about trying to apply God's word to their life and family. Yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, these can be things that uh, 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 encroach on liberty uh, for individuals and families, and other people want to bring them on and and weigh down uh, other Christians with them. So that's another issue that um, will continue to be a discussion in theological, I mean, in, in uh, Reformed Baptist circles. And I hope that we continue to learn how to work through these things and help teach our people and bring them along to walk in grace with one another. Um, I would even say the role of elders. Uh, mm, sometimes yeah. the, term, the term parody is used in different ways among this the brethren can uh, from two different churches can use the term parody and mean different things by that and uh, an understanding of differences and roles among the plurality of elders that continues to be a discussion um, we want to be careful in the future because of par a party spirit where there can be mm. when there doesn't need to be divisions uh <laughs> You know, you, you can have two Reformed Baptist churches in the same city, five miles apart. They agree 99% with one another, and they'll have more division than they will with a, another church down the road who's not even of the same confession. So, again, uh, we got to be cautious about that. Um, and there's always a rigid kind of individualism. Um, mm hmm and enter into our churches uh, and i've seen this also in in uh in discussion with also presbyterian ministers they struggle with this too a kind of rigid individualism it's not just a baptist thing it even <laughs> happens in those circles it's more of a it's strongly american thing and also mm -hmm. thing. so so the, if that answers your question sean th those are areas that i see in the future that we that we currently are and continue to walk through together and um and they're not easy paths all of them but but we're growing we're learning and these yep. things good things yep um someone actually posted a question in the in the chat here kind of going back to association associationalism um josh marks asked he said are there efforts being made by the reformed baptist churches to exhort the other baptist churches and the association itself in the area of associationalism uh are there efforts being made by the I think he I think he was saying are are there efforts being made to exhort churches in associations I think that might be what uh, question yeah I well what, you know that's each local church and their eldership and that church body will have to make those decisions uh, there are uh, there there are uh, associations um, like our networks, like what is known as Reformed Baptist Network. Uh, there's uh, Association Reformed Baptist Churches of America. Uh, and then there's regional uh, associations like in Georgia, Texas, the Midwest. Um, and then some, there are some areas where there's this strong pastoral um, fellowship among those brothers that functions kind of like an association not officially but but the the churches strongly walk together encourage one another help one another but there's not an official association uh, it's a little bit like that here in virginia right now yeah i don't know what the future holds but there's a a handful of churches here we we fellowship one another we even have a, a yearly keach conference a preaching conference together uh our churches our pastors our friends uh wouldn't be mind uh, bashful to confront one another if we thought a brother was seriously in error or their church. So we, there is a, there is a, a kind of, uh, uh, of accountability there and we help one another, pray for one another through difficult times. And so, and so there's looser things like that, but, uh, but the churches continue to think about this, how to walk through these things and how this is applied. So, Again, that's going to be up to each local church, its eldership, uh, and its church body. All right. 
Well, Pastor Steve, thank you for joining us today for uh, part two. Very good stuff. Um, yeah, we thank you for that. And uh, You're welcome. My yeah. joy. Hmm. Yeah. Lord willing, everyone, we will see you guys next week. We're actually going to start working through uh, one of the books Pastor Steve held up, the Orthodox Catechism, Hercules Collins. We're going to start going through that, um, at least at the chapter level. Um, so Lord willing, we will start that next week. Until then, everybody, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.